Matt Worthy. Really my wheelhouse today or for the, the scope of this is 
But is the revelation of Scripture accurate? In other words, is the message coming through in today's Bible the way that God and the Holy Spirit wanted it to originally? Uh, its preservation through the millennia is adequate. This is what Jacoby says, that it's, that it's adequate. I, I would go beyond that, and I, I, hope, I hope to show you that it's, it's more than adequate. In fact, relative to all of the ancient, ancient documents, the Bible pretty, pretty much kicks everybody else's backside in terms of this. Uh, it is very accurate, its preservation, uh, and that too points to its, its inspiration. And then the accuracy of Scripture is practical. It's, it's useful. Here, here's the thing. If you do the Bible and it doesn't translate into a difference in your life, everything that we're arguing about becomes mute. What does it matter if Jesus really was or what it was, who he said he was, and so forth? If, if you live out his principles and it doesn't make a difference, then everything that we're talking about, more or less, is not worth our time. Here's a quote from a guy who is not a Christian. This is a guy who is uh, an established, or was, obviously he lived a long time ago, uh, historian uh, of European morals, as you can see where I'm borrowing this from. The character of Jesus has not only been the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive to its practice, and has exerted so deep an influence that it may be truly said that the civil record of three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and to soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists throughout history. What he's saying is that one guy, a couple thousand years ago, in a very small period of time, has done more to reshape the moral landscape of every subsequent generation than all of the philosophers and moral thinkers combined. That's power. That's practical. That's measurable, and you can point to it. All of you are an example of that ripple forward in the history of Jesus' moral power to change people. Right? And I can't measure that in a, 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 a beaker. I can't measure that, uh, you know, mathematically. I can't wrap a measuring tape around that, but I can point to that and say, that's real. Look at that guy. He used to be blind, but now he can see. He used to do this and act this way, now he's different. And we have to, if, if at all possible, get close enough to the skeptic or the unbeliever to start pointing their eyes at that data as well. Eventually. Okay? We're going to continue on here. Uh, some of my information today, guys, is just a lot of information. All right? I'm going to try to jazz it up. I'm going to try to make it fun. Uh, but it is what's so fun. Okay. All right. A few things that you have to know. When we're talking about ancient documents, really of any kind, and almost all of these terms, I mean, some of them are Bible-centric, uh, but not exclusively. So an autograph is something that someone signed, right? That's where that term comes from. So when Paul wrote a letter to Philemon, for example, the actual piece of parchment that he wrote on is an autograph. It is the ultimate original. None of those exist. We don't have any of those for any biblical document. They simply would not have survived. Uh, it would be pretty awesome, though, if they did. Uh, a manuscript. This is a copy of an original. So if I'm uh, Onesimus, and I'm there in the church in Coloss, and I receive this letter, and I go, wow, this is an awesome letter. I want to send it over to the guys in Philippi. Uh, did I have to go back there? Sorry. Because they need to read this then I'm going to quickly pen a copy. That's a manuscript. I've just duplicated it. If I leave it, I now have a manuscript. Okay? Uh, the Septuagint, the G is pronounced like a J. Uh, this is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. I'll touch on this a little bit more. This was the Old Testament that Jesus would have read. Uh, it, it, it came about a few hundred years before Jesus came on the scene. Stephen, when he stands up and gives his great speech, quotes the Septuagint, uh, but it was a Greek translation from Hebrew. Uh, a scroll, we all know what this is, right? It's rolled up for ease of use. Uh, papyrus, paper, parchment. Paper is kind of a, a typo. There was no real paper in the sense that we know back then. Uh, and papyrus, just so you know, uh, papyrus is very rare in the world. It's almost extinct. Uh, it's a reed. It used to grow along the Nile River. 
and uh, it's just like a stalk. Picture a corn stalk without the corn, right? It's just a long thing. They would split it up, they would dry it, they would cut it in, in uh, long sections, and then they would lay it sort of vertical and horizontal across each other, glaze it over with sort of a sack, let it dry, and then you've got paper, more or less, uh, old school paper. Uh, vellum is, is sheep or goat skin. Uh, I'm sorry, parchment is also sheep or goat skin. Um, different from papyrus, vellum, calf, or antelope. Now, if you could choose, you'd want vellum. It's going to last longer, but it was more expensive. That's why we have fewer of those, and they kind of came in the later centuries. Uh, and as you can see there, when papyrus became scarce, which they pretty much wiped it out, they switched on over. A codex is what we would consider a book. Right? They got away from rolling out these long scrolls to folding them in such a way. It was still a singular piece most of the time, but it was folded in, in book form. Uh, I was in uh, uh, France, in Paris, this past uh, October, and we went into, uh, I'm going to forget what it's called, but it was the prison that they used to put uh, Marie Antoinette in and uh, a lot of other people during the French Revolution. And in there they had pulled out some of uh, King Louis personal Bibles, and it was pretty cool because that's what they were. They were in codex form, and they were super elaborate and ornate, and in amazing condition, considering they were six, seven hundred years old. Uh, and then Masoretic text, text, that's very important. I'm going to talk about the, the Masorite tribe and the Masorites and why they're so important, but basically it's a group of people, and these guys were the ultimate Bible readers, okay? These guys loved uh, their Bibles, and we owe a great deal to them uh, for the preservation of, of Scripture. A few other things that you need to know. Unkyle is basically a manuscript written in all capital letters, and I'll talk just briefly. I'm not a linguist, but I will touch on briefly Greek and Hebrew. Uh, a minuscule, as we get the you know, minuscule, something small, all lowercase, or what they call common letters. Cursive was more like informal. I'm going to jot down something kind of quickly or something that was strictly for personal use, uh, maybe like a home Bible uh, or a Bible for like a small abbey, something like that. Uh, the monastic community had a few of these. Another thing that they would do, uh, because again, vellum, sheepskin, these things were expensive. You had to literally kill an animal uh, to get more most of the time. And so if uh, a, a Bible or a manuscript started to fade, or uh, it wasn't as clear, it was old, they would literally scratch off the old writing and write over it, and so that's what a palimpsest is. Uh, the Vulgate, that's a translation we'll talk about a little bit more. Apocrypha, this was uh, basically books that we would consider non-canonical, meaning they didn't get accepted into the canon over time. Um, Jerome used this term, hidden away, and I think that term has incorrectly contributed to all the conspiracy theories out there. There is nothing hidden about any of these books. Right. They have been known forever to huge numbers of people. So the Dan Browns of the world, what they are doing is simply exploiting modern ignorance about something that has been known forever. Uh, if you read a Catholic Bible or some other kinds of versions out there, you can read all of these books. Some of them are quite interesting. Some of them, the early church, did treat as scripture. Strangely, uh, some of the early Christians would say about you know, the Gospel of Thomas and some of these other ones, uh, they are not on par with Holy Scripture, but good enough to be read in service. So I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, and then the uh, Pseudepigrapha, uh, this is a text whose authorship is attributed to someone else. So this is where I write a letter, but I write it and I say that I'm Matthew, or I say that I'm Luke, or something like this. This does apply to some of our Gospels, as they were most likely written, not by the man for whom it's named, but, but his followers. Um, here's a few scriptures that are just useful to pull out. Uh, you probably use some of these in your Bible studies with non-Christians, uh, word studies, and so forth. That will help you understand what the Bible does say about itself. Now, if you're going to get to an argument with a skeptic, uh, this argument's not going to go too far. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're serving as your own witness and so forth. It's a little challenging, but a good place to start nevertheless. And also very good for us as believers to know what the Bible has to say about itself.
If you believe that the words that are written there are inspired and from God, it obviously is desirable to know what he has to say about his holy revelation. Um, all right, so if you were to set out and you can have this conversation with your unbelieving friend, hey, in what ways could God have possibly communicated with people? Right? And, and you get into that argument. If, if things were to be written down in a pre-technological era, I mean, really, what was there? These are a few things that we know that they used. Uh, stone, for example, I can't remember the name of it now, but in modern-day Iran, there is a mountainside, and kind of like our Mount Rushmore, uh, an ancient people and civilization climbed up on the side of this high edifice. Uh, archaeologists have no idea how they were able to do this. Uh, and carved into the side of the mountain this immaculate mural of an ancient battle, and then three columns of ancient text in three different languages, and it has stood there for thousands of years. So stone, obviously we know the stone tablets, which we do not have today, but stone was a common way of putting up public information, sort of like a billboard, that would be there for all to see and learn from, all those who were um, educated enough to read. Clay, wood, wax, metal, papyrus, as I've already touched on a little bit, leather, parchment. This was really all that was available at the time, and for, and for a long time, to be able to get the word of God written down on something that can be uh, <coughs> Reproduced and you know publication back then was not like we know it, but but to get out there to be sold, distributed, and so forth. All right. Once we've come to grips with the fact that God can, in all probability, probability, does communicate with mankind, we are ready to consider what sort of message God would provide. Now, like I said before, how, how is He going to communicate with us? And the evidence points to the Bible being the Word of God, faithfully preserved through the millennium. Right? Now, there was also oral tradition. Uh, I would encourage you to read up on oral tradition. When I first heard about oral tradition, I think the modern person right away, when they hear oral tradition, they think of mythology, they think of old wives' tales. That is not at all how ancient people viewed it. In fact, the oral testimony of an individual was actually considered more respected than a written one in ancient times. To be able to verbally provide an account of something that happened or something that went down, especially if it was supported by a multitude of witnesses, we even see Jesus referring to this a few times in the Gospel of John, talking about witnesses that could testify to him and so forth. But this idea of something being passed out orally was not taken lightly, nor was it seen as untrustworthy. Uh, in a society that was largely unread, did not have Bibles, could not reach into their library and pull many books off of their bookshelf, passing along stories, history, lineage, these things were done verbally and they were done with great care. Uh, repetition, mnemonics, memorization, and the flow of information was regulated in a lot of ways to make sure that the oral transmission maintained its integrity over time. And in a lot of cultures, they even had people whose job it was to make sure that it was being told verbally the way it was supposed to be told verbally. It wasn't just, what's your version of events versus my version of events. There was an official oral version in a lot of these things. So for these people to not have available written proof or documentation wasn't a big headache for them uh, in their society. We today, we need to point to 27 sources to corroborate the thing that we say we saw. It was kind of the opposite back then. They could point to a written thing to corroborate the verbal thing. So that's something that we're just distant from uh, these days. Uh, and the evidence available that we have, noted by believers and non-believers alike, is that the written record fully supports the oral record. And when you have both, it's hard to have a firmer argument, even by today's standards. All right, let's talk about the Old Testament first, and then we'll get to the New Testament. So, 
These are some of the main manuscripts that we have today that we can point to at a fixed point in time to say, this is what we have in terms of the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, you can see the dates on them. The dates are fairly late, right? 900 AD, 895 AD, 916, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to talk in a moment about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are going to fill this gap. But I wanted to start here to compare the Bible to other ancient texts. All right? And what we know about human history at large, late copies of the Bible. But there's also a reason why there are so few copies of the Old Testament text. And you can read down there, uh, look at the first, you know, one may wonder why copies of the Hebrew Bible are late in comparison with the New Testament materials, especially when we recall that the Old Testament was much older. And the reason for that was these Masorites that we'll get into in a little bit, whose job it was to, with great care and precision, copy these Old Testament texts, had a tradition that if a text was too far off of what they felt was accurate, they would bury it. And they would have a ceremony where the word of God had become flawed by human error, and therefore the world needed to be rid of it. And so that's why, even though it's been around a lot longer, a lot fewer of the Old Testament texts have survived, because people were systematically eliminated because of mistakes that they made in transmitting them. So it's kind of interesting. That also has a bonus, though, in that the few that were maintained were the cream of the crop. And so even though we don't have many from this era, uh, we have enough. All right? Now, who wrote this stuff? All right? uh, there's some passages in the Old Testament that talk about scribes. Ezra was a scribe. It was a lofty office. It was, it was something that... Uh, we would consider today to be like the equivalent of sitting on maybe the Supreme Court or something, and, and, and you're the one who writes the legal documents that will become the practice and accepted law of the land. Every word, every letter, every comma has to be perfect. And so these guys were, were on it, okay? And they were very big on making sure that it came through very carefully, and they had little systems that they would create. Keep in mind, Hebrew is written without vowels. So the word the would be th, with a dot over the h to, to signify that you should put an e on there. Right? There was also no spacing between the words. So it was just from, and they wrote from right to left, they read from right to left. So start the right side of your page, cram 57 letters side by side with a bunch of dots and slashes over it, with no A, E, I, O, or U, that's Hebrew. Very difficult. And it's still that way today. Right? It's no different. My CIA days, I met a lot of guys that went to the Middle East who had to learn Hebrew. They were all having nightmares and, and waking up with cold sweats trying to learn the language. Very difficult. Uh, Syriac and a few other languages as well, still today, are, are, are written like this. Okay? Uh, to our benefit, these guys and their care and precision and almost a mystical view of their work. They, reviewed, they, they viewed their work as participating in something divine. They really did, because they were passing on God's truth to subsequent generations. That has helped us big time uh, to make sure that they were super careful. I know this is a crowded slide. I wanted to try to cram it in here if I could. Um, they got their name from the word tradition. They practiced their craft primarily uh, over a 500 year period around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they probably did it way longer than that. That's just all the span that we can prove uh, from things that are written about them. These guys were very fanatical. Uh, it's interesting, if you read in the margins of some of these ancient texts, they actually, one scribe will write notes for the next scribe because he knows that his work is going to be copied at some point. And they'll also make comments for the prior scribe, who most often was no longer around, critiquing his work. And in one classic example, 
uh, one guy wrote in the margin, you fool and knave, leave the ancient writing alone. <laughs> and they actually have that written in the margin of one of these old things because the, the, the later scribe was mad at the former scribe for deviating from the correct way of passing this stuff on. All right. Um, what they would do is they would pull together all the variant readings of a passage. So they had a lot of these. They'd pull them together and they would all have little differences in them. And they would sit around and they would dialogue with each other what, what the real meaning was. And you have to understand, too, Dan Brown and these guys will try to make it sound like they're doing this for malicious, underhanded reasons to change the true meaning of the text. That's not at all what they're doing. Language changes over time. You ever read your King James Version? Yeah. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Right? But that was English a few hundred years ago. Language changes. It evolved over time. Words are added and subtracted. There are words that we said 20 years ago. We don't say that. There are words now we did say 20 years ago. The way letters are written, all that stuff changes. A lot of these texts were old even when these guys wrote them, right? So if I'm in 300 BC, but I'm reading a document that was written in 600 BC, it's still 300 years old and things are changing. So there's a lot of challenges with this. It's not, it's not apples to apples like the letter I said, you know, you're writing now, you give it to your, your guy next to you for minutes. You guys are operating on the same linguistic and grammatical plane. These guys are covering centuries, crossing linguistic barriers, cultural differences. You know, even people who speak Spanish, there's different dialects, right? So we get geographical components. All of this is coming into play here. All right? But some of the things that they did to make sure they got as close to the original as they could is the stuff in my third bullet there. They counted all the letters in the Old Testament. They identified the middle verse of the Pentateuch, which is Leviticus 8, the middle verse of the entire Hebrew Bible, the middle word, letter, verse of each book, the number of times each letter appeared in each book, and they would point these things out as they're composing their draft so that they could go back, recount, recheck. This was their way of quality review to make sure that the editorial process would bring about the purest transmission of the original text that they had. And it was highly successful and extremely labor intensive. Um, my eyes hurt just thinking about doing this. Okay? Uh, I already talked about the Hebrew a little bit. Uh, they would have these little vowel sounds. That would become important later uh, because these little dots and dashes and squiggly lines would become confused over time of scribal generations. They would kind of forget, well, just the dash dot and this sort of stuff would confuse them a little bit. Um, going forward, you'll hear me talk about the MT. The MT is the Masoretic text. That's the Old Testament books that we know were penned by these guys. And for the longest, that's really all that we had. Okay, from these centuries right there. Um, the gap is 1,300 years between when the events took place and the late, or the most recent that we have. That's a huge chunk of time. And one of the common principles when you're trying to validate anything historical, religious or secular, is how close to the actual events was the stuff written down. For example, if I set out today to write a first-hand account of the Revolutionary War, right, you, you should rightfully question my witness to those events. Because in order to write anything about it, I am going to be completely dependent on what other people have written about it. And obviously there are no living eyewitnesses to retell the tale. Okay? That puts us in a challenging position when we are trying to say that we know for a fact that the Bible we read today is historically and linguistically accurate. But the news gets better. Before we get into the Dead Sea Scrolls, let's talk about this a little bit. Somebody mentioned, he was, somebody mentioned uh, some of these other writings out there. These are writings that historians weigh on heavily for just about everything we think we know about ancient history. 
If you were to ask a skeptic or a friend of yours on campus, hey, do you believe the Roman Empire existed? How many of them are going to say no? How many of them are going to care? They just accept it as true. Without ever thinking about the fact that they've never met a Roman. <laughs> they've never seen a Caesar. There are no photographs, videotapes, or audio recordings of that era. They've just accepted it as fact because it's been passed on through history books. Well, where did the history books get it? Because the history book that was written in 1952, they weren't around either in the Roman era. Where did they get that information and so forth? This is where scholarship confuses people and, and gets us into trouble. But this is secular works that most of the world accepts without much question. And let's look at what they have and compare it to the scriptures. So on the left there, authors, these are guys that we rely on very heavily for our understanding of ancient societies. And some of them have very few copies of their works available. I mean, look at Aristotle. How many of you have heard of Aristotle? Law books and philosophy books and history books galore rely on this guy, and there are only five copies in existence of anything that he wrote. Only five. Right? Very light, very thin to put so much trust in, right? Herodotus ate Socrates. You know, these are things that for whom none of the autographs exist, mind you, none of the originals. They were all copied by some kind of scribe, philosopher, teacher. Uh, one of their understudies might have produced these things. They all uh, are prone to errors. <laughs> they all have suffered the same kind of issues of integrity that you could levy at the Bible uh, if you wanted to. Okay? So when you're doing analysis, again, I'll harken back to my CIA days. I got to know a lot of the analysts there. And these guys have to compile data, reach a conclusion to inform policymakers, who in turn, in turn make major decisions about war fighting, foreign policy, diplomatic activities that affect you and I right now today. So if I'm 